Hi everybody, I'm David Gregg, the director of the Rhode Island Natural History Survey. The video you're about to watch is an update on a new invasive insect, the spotted lanternfly, that is moving into our area from Pennsylvania. This is presented by URI Biocontrol Lab uh, Manager Alana Russell and Cooperative Agricultural Pest Survey Coordinator Cynthia Qualick. So uh, this was part of a meeting of the Rhode Island Woodland Partnership in March of 2021. We thought we would release it separately so that uh, it would be a resource for everybody about Spotted Lanternfly. Hope you enjoy it. Okay. <laughs> Hi everybody. Um, as you know, um, I'm Cynthia Kolick. I work with the DEM Division of Agriculture um, with the CAP State Survey uh, Monitoring Program. Um, so, and I also have Alana here today, and we're both going to be talking about spotted lanternfly. Um, and before I jump into that, I'm going to talk a little bit about the CAPS program and the funding that we have to do outreach. And um, Alana is going to talk about more of the science part of spotted lanternfly. And um, I know a few of you have already seen this presentation, but we kind of mixed it up a little bit. So hopefully it'll be a little bit more entertaining today than, um, than having to watch the same presentation again. <laughs> um, so a little bit of our program overview. Uh, the CAPS program, CAPS is Cooperative Agricultural Pest Survey Program. Uh, we monitor for plant pests, and those are of environmental and economic concern. So things that we don't have here that we are kind of monitoring to make sure that we continue not to have them here. Um, so it's a cooperative program between DEM's Division of Agriculture, Divis Division of Forest Environment, um, URI, um, both their biocontrol lab and plant clinic and Rhode Island National History Survey. Um, and in addition to that, we also have a lot of cooperators across the state at um, farms, vineyards, landowners. Um, we work with different, um, at the Audubon and Nature Conservancy and land trusts. Um, so all kinds of different groups who have at-risk properties that uh, we can set, they're okay with us setting traps at. Um, so we do monitoring through pest trapping and visual surveys. So that's um, in the picture, you can see one of our technicians from a few years ago checking a trap at a farm site. Um, <clears throat> so what we do is we go around the state, uh, we choose high risk areas. Um, we set up traps for these pests and or do visual survey on at risk crops. Uh, so our goal is early pest detection for rapid response. So the sooner we find something, the faster and more efficiently we'd be able to hopefully eradicate it if possible, um, or at least mitigate a lot of the damage it could cause if left unchecked. Um, so like I mentioned, we do trapping in high risk areas and all of the pests that we trap for um, threaten forests and agricultural commodities. So the program that is bringing you this presentation today um, is the Forest and Agricultural Pest Outreach Program. It's a collaboration between DEM Agriculture and URI's Biocontrol Lab, and it's funded by the Plant Protection Act, um, which is formerly known as Farm Bill. So our goal with this program is early detection through outreach, so boots on the ground awareness. So we're trying to reach as many people out in the field as possible, and it runs the gamut between us that are out, like foresters who are out in the forest, um, farmers, uh, vineyards, even uh, National Grid, we work with DOT, we are hoping to work with the rails. So we try to get a lot of people who are out there and in these areas that spotted lanternfly could potentially show up at first. Um, so the funding provides outreach presentations development and distribution of educational materials. Um, occasionally we can have public organized visual surveys and it provides our mainframe for online resources. So you can find a lot of spotted lanternfly information on 
URI biocontrol website and also on Division of Ag website. So our goal is to inform the public about pests such as the emerald ash borer, the Asian longhorn beetle, and spotted lanternfly. And the reason those are our main goal is because they're kind of easy to identify insects. They are posing an imminent threat. I've, we already have emerald ash borer, but it's part of the program. <laughs> and um, so they're, they're pests that the general public would be able to find. Um, and also people who are out in the field where some of the other moths and beetles that I trap for are not very um, conspicuous. They're just very, they look like a lot of native things that we have here. So these are kind of like flashy and devastating. So it helps to have others looking out for it as well. <clears throat> So a little bit about spotted lanternfly. Um, spotted lanternfly's scientific name is Lycorma delicatula. Um, it's an invasive plant hopper pest and it's native to China, India, and Vietnam. It was first discovered in the US in 2014 in Berks County, Pennsylvania. And it has since spread to a growing list of states including New Jersey, Maryland, Delaware, Virginia, West Virginia, Ohio, New York, and Connecticut. And we've had interceptions, which are an individual find of one insect, not necessarily an infestation. And those were found in Massachusetts and New Hampshire in 2020. This pest is associated with tree of heaven, which is Elanthus altissima. And it's a weedy urban tree commonly found throughout Rhode Island. So here's a picture of where the first introduction was found. Um, so this um, slide, this picture is actually from 2015. So the actual um, first infestation was just within the border of Berks County in these towns. Um, so that was found on September 22nd, 2014. And after the initial find, um, delimitating was done and that is basically follow-up survey to see how far the spread um, or the range of the insect spread has gone from the initial finding site. And this delimitation survey suggested that spotted lanternfly was confined only to this small portion, portion of Eastern Berks County. So Pennsylvania's response after finding um, spotted lanternfly uh, was, as I mentioned, delimiting survey um, shipments were also tracked. So shipments that left Berks County were traced and no additional fines resulted from any of those um, tra tracings. Um, and a $5.5 million Farm Bill Award was put towards further surveying, monitoring, research, and outreach as this was a, an entirely new to the United States pest. <clears throat> so you can watch this graphic this um, is the quarantine area and of spotted for spotted lanternfly, and it starts in 2014 and spreads till 2018. And you can see just how quickly it spread in just four years. Um, so I put this in here to kind of highlight um, what a big concern this is. And now we're in 2021, and um, as you saw from that list of states that we had, we have quite a few. <laughs> it's grown quite a bit. Um, so these are our current impacted locations. So this is, was updated February 12th, 2021. So you can see how far the spread has gone since 2014, and it's only been seven years. Um, <clears throat> so the blue areas are counties that spotted lanternfly is currently present in infestation amounts. Um, the red outlined areas are internal state quarantine areas. Oh, I see the comment from Mark. Um, Rhode Island doesn't have it, so it's just completely off the map. So let's hope we stay that way for a little bit. Um, so Mark had asked what happened to Rhode Island <laughs> on the map. Um, so the red outlined areas are the internal state quarantine areas. The uh, pink dots are individual finds of spotted lanternflies. So you can see it's scattered a little bit throughout Connecticut and Massachusetts, um, all the way up into New York, other parts of Pennsylvania, down into Virginia. 
Um, so those are individual fines. And usually if we have an individual fine, it's only a matter of maybe a year or two before an infestation is found. So it's kind of a precursor to an infestation. <clears throat> Hi, Molly. Uh, Molly asks um, that Massachusetts had an individual find and yes, that's right. So um, if you look up, there's a purple dot in Boston and that was where um, one of the finds was. So continued response, um, there's no current federal quarantine available. So all of these quarantines are state imposed. Um, so some states are imposing it, some are not. Um, so Connecticut does not have currently a state imposed quarantine, but um, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Virginia have quarantines for any materials leaving that area. Um, there are also external quarantines and those are imposed by New York onto infested areas such as Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, New Jersey, Virginia, and West Virginia. Um, so there, Penn State also has a permitting system. Um, so that's for businesses shipping out of the area and they get training on how to clean ship. So to make sure that they don't have any egg masses, nymphs, or adults in their um, shipping contents um, and also how to check their vehicles for um, insects and also um, egg masses before leaving the quarantine zone. So concern for Rhode Island, um, as you could see through that graphic, spotted lanternfly is spreading quickly. Despite our quarantines and control measures, um, populations multiply quickly in infested areas. So you can see the picture of the tree um, with its just enormous amount of spotted lanternfly adults. Um, they kind of swarm like this um, and they multiply very quickly. Uh, we've had three populations found in Fairfield County, Connecticut in fall of 2020. So they are moving towards us and that we've also had interceptions in Massachusetts as well. And we have high populations of its preferred host, which is Tree of Heaven. And this would cause a lot of economic impacts on our local vineyards and nursery growers, and not only goods and commodities being sold, but also a lot of our local vineyards are um, tourist attractions. So also it would impact other parts of our economy as well. <clears throat> so now I'm gonna pass it over to Alana and she's gonna to talk to you about biology and life cycle and a lot of other fun things. Thanks, Alana. All right, thanks, Cindy. Very fun, at least in my opinion. <laughs> um, I don't have my chat box open, so Cindy or somebody just stop me if there's questions and that you want me to answer. Um, so spotted lanternfly, it's not a moth as it kind of looks like, nor is it a fly as the name suggests. It's a plant hopper in the family Fulgoridae. And so plant hoppers are feed on sap of their host plants. And that right photo of the screen, I have an arrow pointing to the mouth part of spotted lanternfly. So that's what's called a piercing sucking mouth part. And they use that mouth part to pierce through the exterior of their host plant um, and suck the sap out um, from there. And actually that, that bottom photo is sort of like a diagram of what lanternflies are doing while they're feeding. So it is a bit different than some of our other um, invasive pests that we're used to, um, like the borers um, and Asian longhorn beetle. Um, similarly to uh, aphids, lanternflies excrete honeydew while they're feeding. The lanternflies are quite a bit bigger than uh, aphids, so we'll talk a little bit about how and why that is uh, more of a nuisance factor. The adults, luckily for us, are quite distinct. And all life stages are uh, quite distinct to identify. So the adults are about an inch in length. Um, on the left is what they look like with their hind wings or with their four wings closed. And then um, on the bottom right is what they look like with the wings spread. And you can see that very distinct scarlet red when they have their wings spread. It is definitely important to know what they look like with, you know, sort of in both postures because probably out there in nature um, on tree trunks or other surfaces, you're going to see lantern fly um, with their, leg, uh, their wings closed and maybe just like a little bit of red peeking through. Uh, the females lay eggs in masses of like 30, 50, maybe even 80. Uh, they cover it with that gray brown um, protective covering that's sort of like clay or putty. Um, but you can see from that photo on the left, they don't always cover all of it. So you can kind of actually see each individual egg cell there. 
So the egg masses as well are about an inch in length. The middle photo is just sort of a progression to show what they look like when they're weathered. Definitely that protective covering cracks a little bit more. And that right photo is just a picture of a birch in Pennsylvania. You can see um, just how many lantern flies there are in the landscape and how they can kind of like aggregate and target one uh, overpositional substrate in the area. Um, the nymphs go through four developmental instars. So first through third, they're um, what they look like on the left side of the screen. They're black with white markings and they're about an inch to an uh, eighth of an inch to a quarter inch in size. And then as they approach that fourth instar, they turn a little bit reddish. They're about half inch in size. Um, but yeah, they're, they're red with like, you know, black and white markings. So when are you gonna see them? What time of year? Um, lanternflies do have one generation per year. So you're gonna see um, each of those life stages only at one time of year. Um, currently, if we did have lanternfly in Rhode Island, we'd be seeing the eggs. That's the overwintering life stage. Um, and it's usually actually coming up pretty soon, you know, late April, May, where uh, the nymphs start to hatch out. So in Pennsylvania, in just about a month, they're probably going to get the first lanternfly egg hatch. Um, where the newest population in Connecticut is, I'm not sure quite when that hatch will be. Uh, maybe it might be a little bit later if it's a bit colder up here. Um, but anyway, the uh, nymphs will develop through their instars throughout the spring and summer. Um, and then late July, early August is when the adults um, start to emerge out. And then you can see there's this really extended um, time period of feeding, aggregating, and flight, where presumably the females are feeding and taking up nutrients so they can develop the eggs in their ovaries. But it's interesting because it isn't until the end of September that they actually start to mate with the males. And then just very quickly after that, um, end of September, early October, when they lay their egg masses. Um, and the adults are not cold hardy. They will die out um, within the first freezes of the year. But like I said, the um, egg masses are the overwintering life stage and they are quite a bit cold hardy. It will be interesting to see how, as spotted lanternfly spreads, um, how that cold hardiness and, and establishment varies among states. But I feel like Southern, especially Southern Rhode Island, we're pretty cool still. I feel like our winters are probably not severe enough to cull lanternfly, lanternfly populations. Um, so what do they eat? Um, unfortunately, the host range of spotted lanternfly is quite broad. Um, they're known to feed on over 70 different plant species. So that's both the nymphs and adults that feed on trunks, branches, and stems of their host plants. It seems like the nymphs are a bit more uh, broad with their host range. They feed on a lot of different things. And then the adults tend to narrow down on a shorter list of species, but it's still quite a few. Um, and that does include grapevines, fruit trees, hops, and a list of hardwood trees and ornamentals. So it's quite broad. There is um, evidence of sort of a strong preference for a shorter list of species, um, such as tree of heaven, black walnut, grapes, maple, willow. So although they're found on quite a few species, it may actually be a shorter list that they're more likely to be found on, and also maybe that are um, needed for development. There is some evidence, early research evidence, of um, diet mixing does help uh, optimize fitness. Um, so there's there's an association there. Um, and as well, there is, uh, you know, lanternflies do feed on a few invasives, so that's kind of uh, uh, important implications for management because these uh, invasives could harbor or support lanternfly populations, um, such as uh, bittersweet, multiflora rose, and like Cindy mentioned, tree of heaven. Uh, when considering the host, uh, the host range of spotted lanternfly, it's important to consider the seasonal host phenology. Um, so here's a figure from a management guide from Penn State University. It's just sort of a snapshot of what lanternflies may be feeding on throughout the year. Um, and basically, I think the take home here is that, um, you know, the impact can be aggregated and concentrated on certain plants at certain times of the year. So it's really important to kind of consider the whole picture when thinking about the host range of spotted lanternflies since they're moving around to different plants at different times of year and when they're in different life stages. Um, and the thought process here is um, that as plants senesce, they're less, less likely to be a host for spotted lanternfly. And the thinking behind that is that um, the musculature of the lanternflies inside their bodies isn't actually strong enough to um, suck the sap out of their host plants. So they really need to rely on um, heavy sap flow of their plants to uh, facilitate that feeding. So of course they're going to be um, targeting, you know, ha uh, healthy and um, active uh, host that, you know, the vascular system or is doing what it's supposed to be doing at that time of year. 
Um, I just want to stop and show a few videos because I think it's very interesting to see them in action. The one on the right plays first. And so these are uh, lanternfly adults swarming um, at an apple orchard. And you can see that the fruit's pretty mature at this point. So this is probably pretty cr close to harvest time. If this were a pick your own operation, it um, would be quite a nuisance. Uh, lanternflies don't uh, harm humans, but uh, I imagine that the general public probably doesn't want to go to an orchard that has this amount, this number, an abundance of uh, lanternfly. Um, and then the video on the left shows uh, lanternfly nymphs that are crawling along on a fence. This is in Pennsylvania. Um, I think that they move quite quickly. Um, they're pretty jumpy too. So I think this is interesting to just kind of see how they move and how um, quick they could kind of, if you put your backpack down next to this uh, bittersweet plant, you know, it could be an issue for getting them and transferring them onto your possessions. So what's the risk of lanternfly moving around and spreading to um, other areas and specifically our area? Well, it's pretty high. Um, the egg masses are quite inconspicuous. And not only that, um, they're, they're found on you know, tree trunks and branches, but also stone and smooth man-made surfaces, including vehicles. Um, so you can see how they can go undetected pretty easily and then be moved around across state lines or county lines pretty easily. So those um, two left hand photos are uh, photo, the upper one is one I took in, in Connecticut of the egg mass on a branch. And then the bottom one is uh, one um, pallet wood, probably taken in uh, Pennsylvania. And of course, we know that pallet wood is, is used in the shipment of a lot of commodities and it moves around quite a bit. So egg mass is going undetected on a surface like this is definitely an issue for spread. Um, additionally, the adults are pretty good flyers. Like I mentioned, they have that really long period of time where they're feeding, aggregating, and swarming around. And there's been reports of the lanternflies traveling miles um, from you know, like the forested edge into uh, vineyards where they really like to be later on in the season. And um, additionally, like you saw in that video, the nymphs are pretty quick and jumpy. Cindy and I experienced that firsthand while we were in uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, we were standing under a black walnut tree that had nymphs all over it. And we just had, had we were just covered in lanternfly nymphs and had to do a pretty thorough check before we left the area to make sure we weren't transferring them anywhere. And the take home here is that spotted lanternfly is a great hitchhiker. And thorough checks uh, before moving items into or out of the quarantine, where, wherever you are, you know, with internal or external quarantines, um, is critical to slow the spread of spotted lanternfly. Uh, and more specifically about the risk of spotted lanternfly coming to Rhode Island, uh, here is a map from a paper by Wakey et al. Um, it's mapping the modeling the potential distribution of spotted lanternfly. In the state. Um, and you can see if you look closely at Rhode Island, we're sort of in the medium suitability for spotted lanternfly establishment. Um, I have heard some criticisms about this model, so maybe it's not the most accurate one, but it is demonstrating that, you know, I think Rhode Island fully qualifies for uh, having the right conditions and habitat for supporting spotted lanternfly. And you can even look, you know, just next door and most of Connecticut is actually high suitability for spotted lanternfly and we know it's already there. Um, so I think the introduction and establishment is Safe to say it's pretty likely at this point. Um, and then I also have this uh, nice USDA map. So this is uh, mapping the, the relative likelihood of uh, spotted lanternfly introduction into the state. And so that, that model is based on uh, features that correspond with the entry of spotted lanternfly to a new area. So via vehicle traffic volume, human population density, rail node density, um, and revenue from indus industry pathways. Um, and darker red ind indicates higher likelihood of introduction. So you can see where we have a, you know, a lot of uh, transportation, uh, tourism, industry, rail lines, highways. There's definitely hot spots for spotted, high spotted lanternfly introduction. Um, and like Cindy mentioned, we do have a high abundance of tree of heaven in our state, which likes are disturbed in urban areas. And I bet that the distribution of um, Tree of Heaven overlays and overlaps pretty well with um, these hot spots of high um, spotted lantern fly likelihood of introduction. So spotted lantern fly is pretty sneaky. It's a good hitchhiker. It evades um, the inspectors in Pennsylvania that are doing checks along the highway, the state police in Pennsylvania and New York that are doing it, um, it's pretty easy to go unnoticed. Um, and in fact, I couldn't resist, but at this slide, um, spotted lanternfly can even evade the Secret Service. So uh, here's a hilarious photo, I'm assuming, of when President Biden was on the campaign trail in Pennsylvania. 
recently um, where a spotted lanternfly landed on his shoulder and the photo was snapped to be uh, forever in the archive of photos. So I think that that was just pretty funny and I couldn't resist including that in this presentation. Um, so we know a tigress that's gonna come here. What is the actual impact, um, impact on plants? Uh, lanternfly is largely considered a plant stressor, so it can, um, it's likely that it, it'll um, significantly damage hosts when present in combination with other stressors. Um, so that could be um, drought or disease, other weather events as well. Um, so it's thought, you know, it has a host range of over 70 plants. It's not going to kill all 70 plant species on that list and not every tree that it lands on. Um, but when combination with the right factors, it definitely could do some damage there. Um, so on the topic of, of um, lanternfly feeding in combination with other stressors, that top uh, right photo is a um, photo of a canker on a maple tree. This, these were street trees in Pennsylvania and they, um, they were seeing a uh, these cankers develop after they, these trees were hit pretty hard with spotted lanternfly feeding. Um, they isolated um, the pathogen in that canker they found and they found the opportunistic fungus, uh, Botryosphaeria. So this is a good demonstration of sort of that secondary, that cascade after lanternfly feeding, what could happen. And I don't know exactly what happened to these trees. I think they're dead or dying. Um, and that I think has a pretty important um, implication towards, especially like if we're thinking about our urban forestry aspects, um, street trees, I, especially these specimen trees could be at risk here um, for feeding damage and later stress. Um, that's not to say though, uh, heavy sustained feeding on a single tree could lead to tree mortality. I think there have been reports of that, maybe more so towards tree of heaven, but um, I think other species, preferred species too, um, that there is the possibility of that. Um, this is no surprise, uh, you know, what the scientists are saying the feeding and do, is doing is lowering the photosynthesis uh, rate of trees um, amongst other things that they're researching. And it's thought that, you know, of course, of many, aside from many things that could um, limit the energy storage going into winter. So stressing these trees even more um, if it's not specifically mechanical energy um, injury as well. So what are the actual signs of lanternfly feeding? Um, that could include oozing sap, wilting, leaf curling, flagging, or just parts of canopy dye pack. Um, and then another impact on plants, it's sort of like a secondary impact that doesn't involve lanternfly uh, actual direct feeding, is um, a sooty mold that builds up on those, that honeydew excretion that I, that I mentioned. Uh, when the lanternflies are feeding higher up in the canopy, um, that sooty mold can build up on lower canopy branches and understory plants. And with sooty mold buildup, that could block the photosynthesis of those plants and cause mortality. So sort of like a secondary cascade where the lanternflies may, maybe didn't feed on that part of the plant or those plants, um, but it's, it could still cause injury to them. Injury to them. So the big question, uh, how is or how is it predicted that spotted lanternfly will impact the forest ecosystem? That's a pretty uh, broad question. And I think, you know, since the invasion of spotted lanternfly is still relatively new in most states and even Pennsylvania, that will, this will be an ongoing question that will be very interesting to see how it plays out. Um, it's likely going to be more of a slow burn than compared to where um, lanternfly, you know, the impacts we're seeing in agriculture, you know, specifically grapes where um, total vineyards, there's been maybe a few reports of total vineyards just being wiped out. Um, and because the uh, host range is pretty broad, it's going to be a little bit more nuanced in terms of, um, you know, what we really see for the impacts, and, you know, like we all know, some of these processes in forested ecosystems definitely take a little bit longer than um, other systems. It's generally thought that um, currently that forests are likely a reservoir for spotted lanternfly. So uh, scientists and managers are having a hard time going into the forest and finding obvious uh, huge populations of spotted lanternfly. Um, so it's been difficult for them to uh, survey and therefore manage for spotted lanternfly in the forest ecosystem. But what they are seeing is that at that time of year where they really start, the adults start moving around a lot, they're coming in droves from the forest edge, so the forest ecosystem, into places like um, vineyards where they like to be later in the season. So that forest reservoir is definitely a key piece that needs to be studied and paid attention to in terms of really, you know, how we're going to manage and approach spotted lanternfly.
So I, I don't want to sound any alarm bells because I think the, the total long-term impacts are really, especially for the forest ecosystem up in the air as of now, but um, I think it's pretty evident that there's the potential for broad stress impacts on the whole stand level here um, from spotted lanternfly. And um, Kelly Hoover from Penn State University, she's a researcher that does a lot of work on like how spotted lanternfly is actually impacting their host plants and trees and the forest system. Um, I took this quote straight from one of her recent presentations where she said, forest productivity is likely to decline without managing large populations of lanternfly adults. So here's somebody that's on the front line that's thinking that um, lanternfly is to some extent going to have an uh, impact on the forest ecosystem. Um, so there's a lot of research ongoing on um, you know, how lanternfly is impacting uh, subjects related to forestry and the forest ecosystem and forest health. That includes um, wood quality impacts, mechanical feeding damage thresholds, uh, the ability for lanternfly to vector diseases, the, and um, the impact of lanternfly feeding on seed production. So that last one especially, I think is a pretty important one, especially um, we know that forest regeneration is a um, huge, is a very important topic for um, forest health in general. And that actually leads me to this next slide, which I wanna talk about um, lanternfly feeding and uh, causing seedling stress. So I have a progression of photos here um, taken by Emily Swackhammer from Penn State University. Um, so these are nymphs that were feeding on a black walnut um, seedling. And in this first photo, you can see there's um, some I don't know, mid to late instar lanternfly nymphs feeding on the tender parts of that black walnut seedling. As time progresses, you can see early signs of foliar stress, some yellowing of those leaves, um, and then lower in the photo, you can see the potential for sooty mold buildup where there's um, honeydew building up and maybe even a, a little bit of sooty mold evident there as well. Um, even later in the progression, you can see this uh, is a very stressed seedling. There's extensive flagging of, uh, of the leaves here, um, and it, in general, it does not look very good. Um, and then Emily Swackhammer came back a year later to do a, a progress check-in on that, and that, um, the arrow on that photo is per, uh, pointing to the terminal leader of this uh, seedling, and it's dead. Um, and there are other cases where the feeding from lanternflies caused form issues, so like the start of codominant stems. Um, and in general, I think uh, the lanternflies, uh, lanternfly feeding definitely has implications on seedling health and forest regeneration. So I think this may be more of some of the early uh, impacts that we're going to see with a lanternfly invasion. And it won't be until later that we could possibly even measure or see what um, lanternflies could do to, to a mature tree or uh, how, yeah, what they're, what they're necessarily doing to mature trees. But certainly the seedling health and forest and how that impacts forest regeneration, I think is gonna be a hot topic for the forest ecosystem health as lanternfly comes in. And of course, there's a long list of other um, groups that are impacted by spotted lanternfly. That's homeowners, the industry, you know, trucking, shipping, uh, also growers. So for homeowners, that um, swarming uh, that we sometimes see lanternflies doing uh, definitely quite a bit of a nuisance. And also that honeydew that they excrete certainly is a nuisance to homeowners where it's getting all over everything. It's unsightly and it's a little bit bothersome. For like the trucking and transportation industries, there's largely just been issues with compliance, but this is a huge issue. Um, it, the uh, upper right photo I have is actually a truck that's sitting directly under a tree of heaven tree, just waiting to get a gravid female to lay her egg mass on or a, you know, a nymph or adult to just stow away on and, and be spread other places. So there's definitely been issues with, with businesses uh, just in increase in, in labor and um, just ensuring that they're not moving around infested material. There's potential fines that are associated with that um, in Pennsylvania. And also that permitting system that Cindy mentioned uh, that Pennsylvania is doing. Um, I did hear that recently that they had something like 26,000 businesses involved in that permitting system. So that's not employees or, or permittees, that's businesses that have probably could have a huge staff of employees. So that just kind of shows the extent to how many people are involved in this process and how, you know, there's a lot of different articles that qualify for regulation moving in and out of these states. Um, so this is a huge undertaking and to ensure that 
all these businesses and people are not moving around invested material is definitely um, costly and labor intensive. Uh, in terms of the growers, the grape growers have definitely been the hardest hit. And I think this is really the, the one group that we're seeing the earliest and the biggest impacts of spotted lanternfly. These growers are experiencing yield loss and even buying death as a result of just directly lanternfly feeding. So that bottom right photo is a uh, vineyard in, um, in Pennsylvania where the feeding either directly or later in the year due to cold stress wiped out, caused a wipe out of all the um, growers vines. Um, so this has also increased the number of insecticide sprays, the average number of insecticide sprays in these vineyards from four, um, which is about $54 an acre to 14, which is about $147 an, an acre um, between 2016 and 18. So this has become very, very costly and labor intensive for the growers. And they're trying to keep up with it and it really, you know, these insecticides might have good um, uh, initial uh, impact of, of cutting back lanternfly numbers, but the reintroduction of just the numbers that are out there in the landscape, uh, you know, you go back three days after the spray and there's just, just as many in the, in the vineyard. Also the ornamental nursery growers, uh, there's definitely issues with compliance about not moving around um, infested material. There have been reports of trace forwards, Cindy's uh, gets news of that all the time, where um, a uh, stowaway lanternfly made it its way on, a, on some nursery stock to a, a state that doesn't have a spotted lanternfly infestation currently. And when tracing that back, it's come from a nursery or something from the infestation zone. Um, so that's been an issue, definitely pretty labor intensive for these, um, for these growers and operations to comply with the, with the quarantine and the permits. And also some of those ornamental trees are definitely favored host by spotted lanternflies. So this industry as well as seeing, seeing feeding damage um, from lanternflies. So I think it's not really a stretch to say that uh, lanternflies are, are having a huge impact on the economy in uh, Pennsylvania. So I have this quote taken straight from the Penn State Extension website. If not contained, spotted lanternfly could drain Pennsylvania's economy of at least $324 million annually. And that's according to an analysis conducted by economists that were sponsored by the Center for Rural Pennsylvania. So um, no surprise there, it's having huge, it has the potential to have huge economic impacts in Pennsylvania in the mid-Atlantic. And I imagine if and when it comes closer and more into New England, we could see the same thing. So I'll just go a little bit quickly because I know we're trying to stay on, um, on topic with the agenda, but I just want to touch on uh, some of the man management methods that are available. Um, this is where, you know, lanternflies are, do have infestations. So these are management methods that are recommended in Pennsylvania. I think, you know, if you want to look further into it, there's so much information out there on the extension websites, but I'll just touch on what's available. Um, there are cultural and mechanical methods um, available, such as scraping eggs physically off of their surfaces and squishing them. Uh, that I just want to mention, there has been research that came out recently that uh, I think 90 or 95 percent of the egg masses on a tree are found three meters or above into the canopy. So in terms of uh, what you're seeing at eye level, you're just seeing the tip of the iceberg if you see lanternfly egg masses there. Um, so that's a pretty interesting uh, bit of data that just came out recently. Um, also, there's tree banding and trapping that are available. Um, the removal of tree pepping, which I'll touch on a little bit. There's also chemical management methods that are um, available. So there's nymph and adult targeted insecticides that are labeled for use um, in Pennsylvania. And there's also a bit of biocontrol management um, research that's been happening on two parasitoid and two fungal pathogen species currently. Um, just to touch on that whole subject of Tree of Heaven, uh, I don't think I need to tell anybody here, but in terms of, you know, suggesting to, to let, uh, stakeholders or landowners if they want to feel empowered to um, try to do something to combat spotted lanternfly, there is the talk or question of whether or not Tree of Heaven should be removed. If it is decided to be removed, you know, it is an invasive herbicide is necessary. Mechanical removal will not do anything. It could just, it will just cause more to sprout up and maybe even contribute more to the abundance of Tree of Heaven in the area. Um, but out of that conversation, there's been a lot of question of should growers and landowners remove all of the Tree of Heaven on their property? Um, and I think, you know, on one hand, the there has been research that came out that said, um, 
when lanternfly adults uh, in their diet, when cherry heaven was excluded, um, they were not as prolific as uh, when they did have access to tree of heaven. So the females laid less eggs and they developed um, slower when they did not have tree of heaven. Though on the other hand, um, managing tree of heaven, I think is impossible to remove all of it in our area, in our state, and it's also very costly. So I think it really is, uh, comes down to, you know, to recommend this would be really on a site specific um, basis and uh, really what, what would be the purpose of it. You really kind of think have to think about it critically. Um, but I don't I think on a state level, there's no point in trying to remove all the tree of heaven or you know if it's not in the budget and it's and it seems nearly impossible anyway. Um, and it, it could be a good surveillance tool. That's actually what Cindy's been doing a lot of and um, Uri's been trying to help with that too, is just surveying for Tree of Heaven in the state so that we have an idea of the hot spots because that's a good place to go when we get our first few reports of spotted lanternfly. We wanna know how big the extent is where we can go to Tree of Heaven because if they are here, they're likely gonna be on the Tree of Heaven. Um, there is one other uh, management approach when related to tree, tree of Heaven, that's the trap tree approach. So that's, you know, cutting back the population of Tree of Heaven in a given area to just a few trees, and then those few trees treating with a systemic insecticide. So when spotter lanterns fly, come in and feed on those trees, they're ingesting the insecticide and die. And I think this is a good suggestion depending on what the situation is. So if you have a grower, like a grape grower, um, spotter lantern fly really like grapes as well. Um, Removing all the tree of heaven, I think, would not be a good idea because they'll just go, they'll just bypass that forested edge and go straight in towards the grapes. But if you have uh, trap trees surrounding your vineyard, um, it might kind of act as sort of a buffer where they land on the tree of heaven first, ingest the insecticide, and die before they get to the vineyard edge. Um, and so that kind of transitions into there's a lot of ongoing research, especially on chemical management of spotted lanternfly, and for a lot of different groups like growers, nursery practitioners and more. Um, but I just wanted to highlight this one study which characterized the spatial distributions of spotted lanternfly in vineyards. And they found that largely the majority of spotted lanternfly were just on the vineyard edge or maybe up to 15 meters into the vineyard. So that does have implications on where um, insecticide sprays should be targeted. Um, there's no need for these, it's likely no need for these growers to be um, spraying their entire vineyard with insecticides if they can just target the edge of the vineyard and knock back most of the um, lanternflies there. Um, just a quick update on biocontrolled prospects. There are two parasitoid species that are being studied. That's Anastatus orientalis, an egg parasitoid, and Dryanus sinicus, which is a nymphal parasitoid. Um, that top photo on the right is the Dryanus adult, and it actually has this really cool raptorial forelegs that it uses to grab the, the spotted lanternfly nymph. And then that middle photo is a lanternfly nymph that's been attacked by dryness. That, um, that white sac that's attached under the wing pad is called a thalassium. And that's where the developing dryness larva is. And that's how it feeds on the lanternfly nymph. And as it develops, it will slowly kill the, the lanternfly nymph um, until it's ready to emerge out as an adult wasp. And additionally, there's been research on two naturally occurring fungal pathogens. That's Thapcoa major and Wolveria bassiana. Um, in fact, Penn State and Cornell are testing a biopesticide spray containing Bovaria currently um, to see how effective it is at knocking back spotted lanternfly in the landscape. So um, that bottom right photo is a lanternfly nymph that was attacked by Bovaria. So what should you do or what can you tell your stakeholders and landowners to do to prepare for and respond to a lanternfly invasion? I think really the, the best thing you know, it's most important just to, to process that awareness and early detection is key um, for our early response to the spotted lanternfly. Um, what you can do now or what your stakeholders can do now is really just learn how to identify all stages of spotted lanternfly. So that includes what they look like and also um, what time of year you're gonna be finding each stage. Um, if they suspect that they found a spotted lanternfly, we ask that um, people try to take a photo or collect a specimen. That's really the best way for us to really confirm the identity of that specimen, make sure it is spotted lanternfly. Um, and with that photo or specimen, they can go to the um, DEM spotted lanternfly sighting report form, which is linked here. And I can also kind of throw that in the chat box once we're done, um, if people want to save that on their, on their bookmarks bar or anything like that. Um, but they can, people can, uh, uh, report their spotted lanternfly potential find there. 
um, it's so new and I know like we're all a very well acquainted group that um, I, Cindy and I are open to getting emails if there's ever questions or suspected spotted lander fly in that way. I think just really any mode of communication at this point um, when we're waiting to see the first introduction is, is a good way to contact us. Um, and just staying updated with, you know, the spread forecast and research updates and, and just more news like that is probably one of the best ways to prepare for the spotted lanternfly invasion. Um, so here's the DEM spotted lanternfly page and also the URI spotted lanternfly page, um, which I have on our last page that I can keep up for a few minutes if you want to jot that down. And just one last quick plug, there's um, there's a lot of information. If you don't find what you want on our Rhode Island websites, there's a lot of information out there on ex other extension websites. Penn State has just ton, tons out there, especially lots on their management page. They have specific management guides for homeowners, landscape professionals, grape growers, Christmas tree growers. They have a webinar for spotted lanternfly in the forest ecosystem. It is a three hour webinar, but I think that it would be of interest to this group if anybody had an extra three hours of their life. Um, to spare. Um, and, you know, they're constantly giving research updates and stuff like that. And this um, spotted lanternfly dashboard by Temple University, I think is going to be a really good tool for us to use in the future. Um, it's being developed right now, but some of these um, tools are active currently. It's just really good um, mapping and communication of, of, you know, past spread of spotted lanternfly, development forecast, has, hatch forecast, high risk areas. Uh, I think there's, there's a lot of uh, modeling and mapping tools out there that are being developed to really communicate the spread and potential spread of spotted lanternfly. So with that, I just want to say thanks, everyone. Uh, here's Cindy in my email, if you don't already have it, and the DEM and URI spotted lanternfly pa web pages. And I think I'll open it up for Cindy and I to take any questions if we have some time. Natural History Survey videos are made possible through the generous contributions of members and friends. Want to help us do more environmental science and conservation? Hit the like button, share our videos with your circle, subscribe, or make a financial contribution on our website, ranhs.org, or through Patreon. Thanks, and see you out there.